So I'm Jordan Steffi, and I got to know Ethan many, many years ago, but um, one event, the event that lives with me and, and will forever um, was an event that we hosted several years ago at Media Heights, and, and um, Ethan attended, and not only did he attend, but he had some family members who were, were joining us, and um, I'll never forget, it was a Saturday morning, and everybody was there to raise money for the organization. And so um, there was a lot of energy that morning, and we, I think we ended up raising almost $20,000 in that morning, and I'll never forget leaving there, just feeling so good, and uh, and so excited about the you know what all had occurred, and kind of went home, you know the rest of the day kind of went on, and I'll never forget getting a phone call, and it was at night, and um, someone said, "Did you hear about that accident?" And I was like, you know, I didn't I didn't know what they were talking about, and they said on on Route 30, I think it was Ethan. And I'll never forget my heart just dropping, and we we rushed to the hospital, and we walked in, and the doctors said that you know Ethan's chance of survival um, was very very slim, and that he had lost some family members in the accident, and I'll never forget just being crushed. Um, you know, we were just we were just with them, and everybody was just so happy. And um, and eventually, I think it was a couple days after we finally got in to see him, and you know, spent many days, in fact, several months, um, kind of you know, spending time with him. And and with each day, you you could just start to see him um, kind of getting coming more and more back to life. And anybody who knows Ethan knows his smile, knows his laugh. Um, and so to see him in such a vulnerable position, to see him, um, but then at the same time to see him so resilient has just been something that uh, has stuck with me and as I mentioned will stick with me um, forever. You know, he is a symbol of someone who is um, resilient. He is the symbol of someone who has taken an event that was traumatic um, and has used it as energy and as fuel for him to not only um, end up going back to college himself and you know graduating from Hack and getting into Millersville and pursuing his bachelor's degree, um, but he's someone who has used this and and brought brought positive energy to every environment that he's in. He's brought people together. He's given people people hope and I think that that is what this community stands for and I think that's why so many people are drawn to uh, Ethan Ethan A. Vaughn, Ethan Poetic Vaughn. Um, so I'm just so honored to, to have Ethan in my life. Uh, hi, I'm Amanda Klinger and I have known Ethan for a, probably a little over 10 years at this point. And I am Shari and I have known Ethan for 10 years also. Um, so, to start things off, the the uh, day of Ethan's accident, we were um, we had a, a pretty large uh, fundraising event at Media Heights, and Ethan was there. Ethan is always super excited to uh, to be a part of the foundation and to help with events and. Uh, there was an accident, and they believed that Ethan was involved in it. Um, I had called my niece and she came to pick me up and my son and uh, another friend were already at the hospital and we went in to see Ethan and um, the chaplain he you know wanted to prepare us and just said that they just really didn't know what was going to happen um, it was too soon to tell, but it was a miracle at that point that he was still alive. We went through the ER and we told the nurse down there who we were looking to see. And um, I remember her crying and saying that the night before she was there when Ethan came in and that um, they thought that he had died and that it was such a severe accident. Ethan could not remember um, who was in to see him. He was coherent part of the time, but uh, 
he he didn't remember many things at all and um, he was sent in for several emergency surgeries and I remember Shari calling me I was at work and and I was just praying for him that the surgery would go well and be a success and that he would come out strong and Ethan did definitely come out strong he he is a fighter and he just kept on fighting I believe it was after a, about a month Ethan was moved to um, a rehab uh, that was close by and after recovering fully from his um, from his accident, Ethan went on to not just tell his story and be an inspiration to other people, he actually went back to school and uh, to college. He got his degree and um, he is now an inspiration to uh, children who've been going through difficult things and how they can uh, look at him and, and see how inspiring he is each time we would go in he was getting a little bit stronger and he was getting his personality back and and within weeks he was joking around with us and um, doing his normal Ethan things that he did and it was and it was fun and it was a joy to see him and um, for something that was so tragic and so serious and severe uh, to see how strong he was and how he just pushed through and persevered and didn't let any of the obstacles that came in his way hold him back was truly an inspiration to watch I mean he is a true miracle um, the doctors the nurses they they just couldn't believe it and and there's, there's no doubt that Ethan is just a, a miracle this is Linkster Community Television um, Jade Grove talking with Ethan Vaughn today, so thanks for having me. Yes. Yep, thank you. <laughs> All right, so before we get into it, um, just tell me a little bit about yourself and your background. I was born in Callan Township, which is in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, at Brandon Hospital. My mom always used to tell me it was a hot day when she wanted to labor with me. <laughs> and I'm the second of both my dad's children and my mom's children, so I'm kind of mm -hmm. like a middle child. Okay. And growing up in Coatesville, I lived in the city, also on the outskirts. Spent family time together, childhood friends, and then in 2001, my mom decided to move to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and it was a big transition my eighth grade year. Yeah, I can imagine. So you've had a journey of a life. You've a lot of ups, a lot of downs. Um, just been through a lot. So. This is the eighth anniversary of something very significant to you. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, this is the eight year anniversary of me being a walking living miracle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every year it just changes where I would get, get, feel like I'm depressed, feel like I'm weighed down because just remember everything what I went through in that process during that day, but also in the life journey that regained regain my life back together. But it was just different this time around. I realized, you know, when I started going to people's funerals, they weren't about, you know, talking about sad, but really about celebration of someone's life, someone's achievements, someone's legacy. And I felt like I needed to do that more often and celebrate my anniversary. No, that's amazing. Definitely celebration is key. Um, so tell us a little bit about like what that, what happened and kind of like how you were able to pick yourself back up. You said you were a living, walking miracle. Uh, it started with Jordan Stebby's foundation, mm -hmm. Children's of a Chance, also known as Atalo. Basically, we were at Media Heights Golf Tournament, helping raise funding for the inner city youth. Mm -hmm. We exceeded that goal, and then I left. And then, unfortunately, I took a car accident with an 18-wheeler mm -hmm. head on. I wasn't supposed to live because of a 99% chance of death versus 1% chance of life. Even with the firefighters uh, cutting open the car, even with the ambulance people driving to LGH Hospital, which is Lancaster General, mm -hmm. and you know, Dr. Wartella stopped what he was doing to perform this emergency surgery, which had a very, very slim chance. And after the surgery, a few days later passed, and I woke up in a very high state of all medicine. Can and imagine. 
Then I was declared walking in a miracle. And then, even though I overcame that death process, there was a lot of bodily injuries and rehab was very intense. And I was placed on a feeding tube because my larynx had became paralyzed. Oh, wow. So that's that's insane. How once you you know went through that recovery process and kind of realized that that's what they thought. What were your feelings and emotions knowing that, you know, you maybe weren't supposed to survive, but you did, and you're here and you're pushing. It, it I didn't realize it was a one percent chance until later on in my life when I did mm -hmm. research. That surgery was very risky and. It, most people don't make it out of it. Most mm -hmm. people die eternally from eternal bleeding from the car accident I had. I ruptured my aorta artery, which is a main valve that produces blood throughout the body, but for some reason, that did not happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, how it didn't happen. I just know it was a higher calling. Yeah, someone's looking out for you. It's amazing. So how, how long was that recovery process? And how did you kind of motivate yourself every day to you know, work to get better and eventually to get to the place where you're at now where you're pursuing your education and you know making major strides? It was a long journey. It's just being on that feeding tube kind of delayed the, the recovery process because I'm on a feeding tube. I can't drink anything. I can't eat anything. I miss out on cookouts, mm -hmm. birthday parties, graduations, and I'm just only time I really came outside was just for church, appointments. Other than that, I'm looking out the window at people, mm -hmm. and I'm underweight, and life was just not looking like hope at the time because there was no telling if I'll ever eat again or drink again. But once I was finally asked to pass the eating test, uh, let's just say I crashed the buffet line several <laughs> times, and pretty much. The recovery process started taking place when I started eating again mm -hmm. and I was able to get my driver's license with help of different people. I was able to get back in college uh, awesome. through Harrisburg Community Area College with acceptance. I was able to start working for the school district of Lancaster with the help of uh, John Mitchell, Mr. Michael Pierce, and my former football coach uh, Chris Booth. And I started working the sports programs at J.P. McCassey High School and middle school and freshman. So you have your hands all over Lancaster then, yeah. you know, um, so how, how exactly, so you mentioned that you're involved in the school district and you're involved kind of in all these different things. Um, what advice do you have for other people who want to get involved in their community and do the same as you? You have to find your gift and you have to find your purpose in life because once you find your purpose and gift, you'll find what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do and everything you will do with your gift will come more natural and more of a blessing to other people. Mm -hmm. It's not always about getting something in return, it's about investing with your time wisely. And you also have to look at the long-term future of, you're gonna be making transitions of outgrowing people. Mm -hmm. Some people you gotta cut off because they could be holding you back. Some people like the person who you are now the same person you've been for years, but as soon as they see a sign of growth, all of a sudden they want to stunt you. Mm -hmm. But it's not that you're like cutting them off internally, it's just a situation where some people in your life have a season, some people in your life are for a day, or some people are just in your life for a certain time period. And it's not that you don't love them or don't like them, it's just you got to go in another place that you can't take them. And that's very true. So as much as you're here kind of giving back to your community. You're also living for yourself, which is key. And yes. kind of not letting anyone um, affect your life negatively, which I think yeah, is awesome. Uh, yeah, it, I had to cut some people up because it's just, I can't do what I was doing before, expecting different results. Mm -hmm. And you get, and I get to see things differently and I get to see things more clearly about what somebody's intention is. Because when someone has a conversation with you, they're already asking for your time. Mm -hmm. And then it comes down to are they asking for a favor, asking for money, or they're just gonna have a conversation with you just to catch up. But there's over 2,000 years worth of information in this world. We should know how to overcome adversity, whether it's through foster care, domestic violence, addiction. It could be overcome, but the person has to want to get it. And that's part of my process, you know, when I went through that rehabilitation process, you know. 
I really wanted my life back because I didn't want to be sitting in a wheelchair because I had to start all over with walking again. And yeah. once I started, you know, eating again, walking around, then my athletic talent came back, the poetry talent came back, the spoken word talent came back. And during that time period, I really saw who was there for me and who wasn't. So you mentioned one thing that I think is key, which is overcoming adversity. Um, not only kind of through your journey have you overcome adversity, but it, it seems like you've really made major strides in just finding who you are and developing that. Um, you mentioned like the spoken word and the poetry. Talk a little bit more about what that means to you and how you can express that. Uh, originally growing up, I didn't want the attention. I didn't want to be the center of attention. I was shy. I was mm -hmm. conservative behind the curtains of Broadway on ice and pretty mm -hmm. much just kept to myself. But I started listening to music and I realized I can write it better than them because I put more thought, I could put more mm -hmm. thought into it in more detail and provide more musicianship. And I just started writing in my own free time and then an opportunity came at a baby shower just to speak on the southeast side of Lancaster. I spoke there and then an opportunity came to open up for Black Ice, original artist for mm -hmm. uh, Def Jam. Uh, records. It was uh, formerly, and the person in charge was Russell Simmons. And from there, I started speaking at Franklin Marshall College, Millsville, one time in McCaskey, one time in Philly, one time in New York. Now I have a YouTube channel, oh, wow. Instagram, Snapchat, and now I don't really put my poetry out there as much because I rather I feel like. What the words I speak and the message I convey, mm -hmm. I rather put them on a better platform where I rather to go about it in a more professional way instead of putting everything on social media and then some people will catch on to online. Mm -hmm. So you've really come a long way then. You said you used to be super shy and like putting yourself out there now. Yeah. Here you are like at colleges, at different events. Yeah. It's like a really long way. Um, what are your kind of dreams or your aspirations? Is, do you want to kind of follow the poetry and music route, speaking engagement? Or you know, really work hands on in your community, a little bit of both. What's kind of the dream? Uh, I believe in being balanced. Mm -hmm. I still do my poetry as far as the writing aspect, as far as in my own free time. Mm -hmm. I don't perform as much because it's just I'm focused on college, That's work, <laughs> my internship. I gotta make sure I take care of my bills, mm -hmm. my priorities first. It's good to have talent, but I have to be independent for myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, speaking of education, I graduated from a uh, Hack Harrisburg Area Community College Congratulations. in 2000, December 2017, and then a month later, transferred to Millsville University, and I've been a junior, and uh, I look awesome. forward to hopefully getting that bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And what would your bachelor's degree be in? Communications, mine in broadcasting. Okay, makes a lot of sense. That's awesome. Looking forward to that. Um, what would be just one piece of advice you have for people who are watching and just kind of approaching their everyday life? Because you just seem like a super positive person who loves giving back. What advice would you have? Uh, you have to really look, look at yourself in the mirror and write down what do you really want in life and really look at the people you surround yourself with. The people you surround yourself with the most is who you likely become. It's one, of the thing, it's one thing to think about, oh, I want to make money, I want that car. But if you're not wanting to go through the process of saving money, be a discipline, reading books to help grow your mind and grow habits that will help better your life, while also making the sacrifices, because if you're not willing to sacrifice what you're doing now for something greater later, you'll be in the same position you've been in for five, ten years from now. And you can't keep blaming or pointing the finger at people because eventually you have to grow up and say, I have to do better. Because it's one thing to want better, but if you're not doing what it takes to be better, then you might, you might be missing out on your life uh, journey. You might be missing out on your purpose. You might be missing out on your gift. Because everyone who's born to this world has a purpose and a gift. Nobody was born here without a reason. Even the people who are not as talented have a lot of heart. Even the most talented people have some of the strongest work ethics to, to perfect their crafts. That's very, that's very wise, I think. So being able to sacrifice things, um, look in the mirror and not point the finger, 
and then just kind of evaluate what you want in life. Those three things. Um, I think definitely if everyone thought about every single day, we'd all kind of be maybe a little bit further in life or closer to, um, you know, following all of our dreams as well. But So thank you for that, Ethan. Um, so my last question then, or second to last question would be, so you have all this content, right? Where can we follow you? You mentioned your social media a little bit, like yeah, your uh, handles, all that information. Uh, my Instagram and my Snapchat is EthanPoetic23. Mm -hmm. My Twitter is EthanV23. I'm also a professional on LinkedIn, Ethan Vaughn. <laughs> and then Facebook, I have two pages. There's Ethan Vaughn, the normal page. And then there's Ethan Poetic, the pages for like, where I just post motivational videos or stories of other people's uh, testimonies or something that's more informational on someone's health mm -hmm. and to help improve. Perfect. So uh, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, all of the social media is co uh, covered. So you can follow all of Ethan's um, content <laughs> there. Um, and then finally, so you mentioned in the beginning, this is your eighth anniversary. Um, what are you doing to celebrate this and to acknowledge all that you've been through and overcome? Well, I'd like to thank Frank for allowing me uh, the internship to do my story mm -hmm. on a local television station. He's a kind-hearted man, and he's found his purpose, he found his gift. But more importantly, he's giving back to the community, and I believe he uh, deserves support from our community in Lancaster and beyond for uh, LCTV Channel 66. But I'd like to thank Frank for also giving me the opportunity to be myself and be true to who I am and not put me in a box. Mm -hmm. And what was that question to say? Just, and what you're doing to celebrate just this uh, anniversary? Today, basically, I'm going to a basketball game later today. Mm -hmm. It's Coastal versus Kennedy Catholic. It's in the Final Four PIAA. Also, this interview with you. Eat lunch later on, eat dinner, and do all those things that I celebrate more in a private way. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you for having me, Ethan. It was an yes. honor. I really appreciate it. You too. Um, and thank you guys for tuning in.